Hey guys, in today's episode, we're looking at Carlton, how they went in 2022, and what their future looks like in 2023. Uh, today, we have Pommy Noz with us. Mad Carlton supporter. Mad Carlton supporter to chat about his feelings in the team. How you doing, Pommy? I'm not so bad. How are you two big fellas going? How are we doing? Are we all right? Yeah, I'm good. How you yeah, doing, mate? Jay? Killing it. Yeah, yeah. Really excited. Talking about the blues. And uh, we've got none other than Pommy and Oz. Absolute superstar over there with the blue abroad. So excited to have you on board, Pommy. I am excited to be here, mate. I'm ex- even though you're an Essendon fan, I'm excited to do this with you. Mm. Um, awesome. How are you feeling about footy? I guess AFLW is there, but like the men's game being back, all the information coming out about how the players are going pre-season training, that kind of thing. I personally am getting really revved up about it. You know, nice to jump back on big footy and have a look at everything. How are you feeling, Pommy? Well, I mean, Carlton are the pre-season specialists. So, I mean, particularly mm-hmm. the last decade, like, uh, it's our grand final time, this, like, four-week period, trade period, draft time, and uh, then returning to training. But, no, there's... I've, I've just done the Blue Abroad show today, and I said that there's kind of, like, a nonchalant feeling about Carlton this year. It's not like you're trying to rev yourself up. It's not like you're trying to, like, you know, find your happy pills because last year was so bad. It's kind of like there's an assured confidence about the boys and we'll come on to it later about the trade period, but it just seems like everything that's coming out about the club feels like there's proof that the club has changed in direction. There's none of this dangled the golden carrot to redo your membership. Even the trade period and the draft period, we acquired the targets very early and we actually followed through with the plan that was laid down. There was no surprises. We wanted outside run. We got it. We wanted some protection with our tolls. We got it. We said we were going after Blake Akers. We got him. So it, for the first time in a long time, it feels like the club are telling us one thing, but then executing it. So I would say there's excitement there, but it kind of feels like this is how a football club should be run finally. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you feel like that's kind of the maturity of the club or maybe something that Voss has kind of brought in with him? You know, you've actually got someone who can coach at the helm so everything else is settled down a little bit. I think I've got to give credit to Sayers um, since taking over as the president. I think he's made some incredible acquisitions, board, board wise and uh, in upper management. Brian Cook coming over from Geelong. Obviously, we know Geelong are the most annoying team in the AFL. They seem to have a perpetual age of 30 and continually finish top four. It's the most yeah. annoying, not it's so boring being Geelong. I mean, I mean, imagine being constantly top four all the time. Do something else. But yeah. he's brought that kind of safe, boring approach to Cal and that it's structured. And I think Vossi is coaching the boys like he played. It's all about yeah. maximising your potential and being real about who you are. And I feel like there's a lot of maturity in the group. You hear Cripper speak last year versus when he was leader the year before. You even hear Harry Mackay talk today from the disastrous interview he did mid-year where he kind of downplayed finals chances and said that that wasn't an indication of where the club were. You can see this maturity before your eyes in the group where I think as a Carlton fan personally, since we're doing this rebuild, you kind of just questioned if they are actually building anything and the rebuild was maybe someone bought a big Mm. load of Lego. They actually Mm. feels like some visual rebuilding going on between our eyes. So, yeah, quite bullish about our chances moving into 2023. Definitely. Essendon are also notorious for the preseason grand final. Look at us, we're flying. Look at us, everybody's killing it. Get the memberships in. Last year it was, look at us, we went, we made a final earlier than expected. Jump on board, everybody, 150 years. But, like, I, it feels a lot more quiet this year, I think. Uh, the messaging for us is very clear that it is we are very early in a rebuild. For you, it's as you say the quiet the quietness coming out of Carlton is it's a steely resolve. It's a it's a confident quiet. It's it's one where we don't need words to talk about how excited we are for the year. We're going to show you. Uh, and 
I've, I mentioned this, we had, we had a live stream uh, of, of the draft and someone was asking which team do I like next year and I, and I told them that I like Carlton. Uh, I think I think you're really building uh, well organically and you're doing some, you know, some really smart recruiting. That must have hurt you to say that, to be fair. Firstly, <laughs> massive respect for you to say that. But, um, no, I agree. I mean, like, come on. I mean... <laughs> I think the big thing for me is Carlton are the perfect meme, aren't they? I mean, f- throughout the last 10, 15 years, pre-season comes, we know what's, you know what's cooking, you know we're coming. Do you know what I mean? Carlton are the masters of talking, talking a good game. Carlton for the last 10 years, in my opinion, have been like Tyson Fury with this Chisora fight. He builds it up and builds it up. And at the end, you've seen better fights mm-hmm. when your granddad was came in late. And your nan told him off. It, it, it's it, Calton are very good at selling that. But yeah. I think when you look at tops, top sides, Geelong don't talk the big talk. Geelong just do it. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Look at that trade they did for Bowes. There was no song and dance. If, like I said, if Calton did that trade five years ago, we would have been like posting big video memes of we're about to rip yeah. Gold Coast off. Prepare yeah. for it. Geelong just came in and said, right, here's pick set. We've got pick seven and we've got bows and we've totally manipulated the AFL rules and they didn't care. You look at Melbourne Storm, Bellamy doesn't tell you all the time he's going to win the flag. Doesn't tell you all the time, he just does it. He executes. You look at the great bull side, they just executed. And that's what's nice about Carlton. We ain't talking about it anymore. We're saying this is the plan for us to get to X. And we do the plan where before it would be, oh yeah, we're going to win a flag in five years. Okay, what's the plan? Ah, but it looks good. Do you, do you think that's a bit like we talk about the shift in the attitude? Do you think that's a bit of a in the past they had to try and preach false hope? This is going to be our year. We're going to make finals, blah blah blah. Whereas now the fans and the public can kind of see it building to that point, so they don't have to preach that false hope anymore. Yeah, I, I think they preached a narrative. And I think the wonderful thing about Carlton is I think, and I, I say this with the utmost respect, I, I think Carlton would be in the top percentile of passionate fans. And with mm, passion, definitely. two things happen with passion. One is the horrible word, hope. Hope is a horrible thing to have in sport. And the other thing is expectation. I think they rode the coattails of hope for too long. And sometimes I got the impression that they kind of, used our history in the wrong way. And it was the expectation of, we have always been historically one of the best sides in the AFL. Like Essendon, were serial flag winners. And they fed the club fans hope through ridiculous things that it was going to return that way. I think the last couple of years, we've honoured that history and we've looked at what made us great. And what made Carlton great was, was that we saw what we wanted and we took what we wanted. And you can't do that anymore because of the equalisation. So the club has now seen a plan it wants and it's ruthlessly executed that plan with its delistings, with its acquisitions. And I think that's an exciting time for Callum because I think we can't win the flags the old ways. We have to do it through the draft. And I think now this last, particularly since Austin's got there, there's a clear draft strategy and there's a clear measure of what we need to do. So it is an exciting time. Yeah, and you guys, we will talk about the trade. Especially it's loading. But um, you guys have had a fairly, I guess, would be a, a quiet year off season as well. So a bit different than previous years. Uh, uh, it's a shame for the AFL because Cal and uh, the Brad Pitt of off season. Do you know what I mean? It, it was nice to hear players like Dunkley request trades and Cal's name not there. I mean, that is the worst thing as a Carlton fan is it's a detriment to how bad your year's been when you're linked with every player that potentially wants to move to Victoria. So it was quite nice. Yeah. So you finished nine. It's, we, we're not going to dwell on it a lot uh, because it was a tough, tough season, especially with the hope and expectation that you were talking about. And you showed enough. I think this, you know, I think, there's no denying that you showed enough this year that your best is well and truly up there, well and truly capable of pushing the best, the, the best sides in the comp. Um, but you were just let down a few times. But we're going to focus on your best performance. And I thought 
we thought that your best performance was your 31 point win against Frio. We think that you really, you know, Frio were a top six side this year. They they won an elimination final. And in this game, you know, at Marvel Stadium, you really, really destroyed them in all facets of the game. Um, what do you think has been, you know, we're not going to highlight the negatives. What do you think was the best thing that you saw in this 2022 season? Um, I, th- I think it was, I mean, particularly if it's a tale of two halves, I think, this season. I think up to the bye, um, which I, I think we really did show a new brand of football. Usually Carlton are the nice guys of AFL. You come to play Carlton and we give you four points and uh, an easy time. I think we actually saw a turnaround this year where we were hard to play. We were awkward, particularly in the first 10 rounds. We were willing to fight you. We were willing to go toe-to-toe, particularly around the contest. Um, mm. I think mm. that half on game sticks out, how we dominated and then we did the most Carlton thing ever and give up a massive lead. But it was the heart and the spirit that these boys could knuckle down and do it. The Richmond game, coming from, what, 20, nearly 30 points down to destroy them and run over the top. The Sydney game, for me, was my favourite performance because that week, Kane Corns and the media said that they were the smokies to win it, and I thought we beat Sydney up. We showed Sydney that, you know, they're not as tough as they thought. Um, For me, the big take-out of this year is the bye obviously affected them, eight and two at the bye. Um, Carlton usually at that stage are used to being two and eight. Do you know what I mean? That's what people forget. And I think you really saw the mental fragility of this group that sometimes it's, e- I remember saying it on Blue Abroad, sometimes it's easy if you're a boxer in the 12th round to be behind on points and your coach say, you want to be heavyweight champ in the world, swing for the fences. You're going to lose this fight. The best you can hope for is a knockout blow. By the by, mm-hmm. Cowton with the boxer who was on the other end, and it was you're going to be the world champion. Just don't get knocked out. And suddenly, you were like, "Oh my god, don't get knocked out. That's scary. Don't get hit. Don't get hit." And it starts to get in your head. And that's what Cowton have got to learn this year: the sustainability. And I think that's where we lost, particularly in the second half of the year. You saw there was a fragility of this group. There was a little bit of uh oh moments. You kicked two goals in a row against Cowton. You could see they were scared. They started to get a bit tentative. And it's understandable. Carlton, with all due respect to my great club, have been specialists in failure for the last five years. And suddenly they were being talked about as a finals hope, a smoky to win the flag. And it's all a lesson. And the best result for me, and I'd never say not making finals a success, but I think how we went out on finals is probably the cruelest but the best motivation for these boys. Because if Doggies had lost and Carlton had snuck in, I think maybe that would have papered over the cracks. Um, I love how Voss has reacted. They need to get better and get busy at getting better. They've got it in them. Like you said it yourself, our best is good enough to beat anyone in this side. The difference between Geelong and us is their lowest rating is pretty good. Their highest is supreme. And that's something that these boys need to learn. They need to learn it fast. The time is right. And if they can't do it now, there will be that sensation that they may never do it. But all lo- signs point to Rome. They all lead there. And that's what these boys have got to do now. They've had the punishment. They got the rewards at the end of the season and Cripper won the Brownlow. Times are good. This is the time now. This list is primed. There's no reason that they should fear any 17 sides in the AFL come round one. Nice. So speaking of that, there have been some changes to that side, and it has gotten better. You got your man, you got your Blake Acres, you got your winger, you got that outside run to support the likes of Walsh, who's running past there. A lot has been on his shoulders. It's great having a dedicated winger that can maintain some width on the ground and help you move that ball with speed and get it to your twin tower monstrosities up there. Colton, you know. Coleman medalists, it's ridiculous, that yeah. forward line. There was that moment in the year, there were there was talks comparing, is is your forward line better than Geelong's forward line? And if you're having that discussion, oh, my God, you want to get that ball moving quickly. So you got your man in acres. You tell us, you happy with this selection? 
Yeah, hundred percent. I think that last year one of our major issues was, and it was heavily documented, was our spread. And you look at Carlton under pressure, particularly they start to go to help that centre. And there was a lot of times, particularly Adelaide's a great show, guys. Getting out wide against Adelaide is the secret to beating them. And our wingers started to pinch yeah. in and really help the midfielder. Before you know it, you've got 18 blokes almost in a straight line on the field. And Adelaide just pe peppered us with that crossfield kick. Um, Blake Akers is a hard runner. He runs up and down. Blake Akers isn't... You, you, I mean, Blake Akers isn't the star of the movie. And I don't think Carlton needs stars of the movie anymore. They need good, solid co-stars. And Blake Akers, we know what Voss was obsessed with Jack Noons and his reliability. Blake Akers is, if Cal Amon and Ed Langdon are the best wingers in the league, Jack Noons is the $2 shop version of them. Blake Akers, we've gone to Audi to get a winger, a good, honest winger. And this guy does what he says on the tin, defends hard, um, gets his 20 touches, works hard all game. And I think he's a good, honest winner. And he puts pressure on the other guys that we trialed there. O'Brien had one of the roles locked down. We saw Walsh had to float over there, but that didn't quite work because it took him off the centre. Carlton need that bit of competition because there was a time where O'Brien got dropped straight back in the side. Blake is there. That's good. We've gone to talk about some more we've drafted, but that competition now for spots in a massive weak area is hard. And Blake Akers is the benchmark. And to knock this guy out of the team, means you're a pretty good winger. Mm. I think for me as well, it's probably one of the, like, what one of the trade periods where you really haven't overpaid for a player to come into the side as well. What You give up, like, a third-round pick or something for Akers. You got your man, and, and his run in the last eight or so games were pretty phenomenal too. It, it's funny. A lot of Fremantle fans giving Carlton State going, oh, he's rubbish, oh, he's trash, but... I need to remind them that I think the mongrel punt did a wing result thing mm. and they were all complaining that Blakers wasn't top three wingman because I quote, he's better than Amon. So yeah. how times change when you move. But I like Blake Akers. He's, yeah. he's a good, solid player. This is where Cowton needs to improve. And Blake Akers, his worst game is a 6.5 out of 10. And that's where Cowton, I think, is a big miss when you compare us to Geelong like Joe did earlier. Our, our twin towers are better than Geelong's. I think the big difference between Carlton and Geelong's is if you look at Tom Atkins there, who's a guy that's not very fancied, his worst game is seven. His best is 9.5. You look yeah. at Carlton or Brian, say, his best is seven. His worst is one. And that is where the flag, in my opinion, is won and lost. It's not your best five players. It's your bottom five to eight players. And Blakers is going to be that guy that sets a benchmark. You look at Cam McIntosh in 2017, Richmond. You look at the players that weren't heralded as superstars that put shifts in week in, week out. And that's what's wonderful of Blakers. You're going to get 7 out of 10 every week, come rain or shine. And that, that's what Carlton need more of. We need more good, honest footballers. So looking forward to seeing this kid strut his stuff in the uh, mighty Navy Blue. And you've already come to the name Blakers, so, you know. He's got Mate, well. yeah, just, 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 just scrap the lake out of his name and go straight in. <laughs> um, so yeah, looking at your, looking at your departures in the team. So obviously, Will said of field left. Um, Will Hayes delisted, McDonald delisted, Jack Nunes delisted, uh, Luke Parks, Liam Stocker, and Tom Williamson. So we might leave Will said of field just for a little bit. But looking at your plays, you're delisted. Is there anyone there who you thought might? you know, what was hard done by to go or everyone's kind of justified? Well, I think you look at that list and there's no flag player there. Mm. Now, maybe the shock for Carlton fans was Liam Stocker. Me personally, I look at the position that we're trialling him in. Who's he getting past? Um, yeah. The midfield thing, there was no evidence in the VFL he was anywhere close to playing midfield. And even if he was... That midfield is very hard to get into. Like, you look at that midfield, and unless you're an A-grade talent now, you've probably got no chance in hell of getting in there. So, yes, it's maybe harsh, but I I like Stocker being delisted. It shows Carlton are ruthless. These are players that Carlton 
in years gone by, Cam Polson, players like that who continually get a year because of a hope, a pipe dream. I liked it. It was fair to the player, but it's also fair to the club. There's no one on that list, do you know what I mean, that I would say Cowton is going to cost us a flag. And I liked it. I, I like the fact we're starting to see now we're not taking chances on players. We're a serious football in business. Yeah, I've noticed that. I'll mention North Melbourne just offhand that I've noticed that with us as well, that um, we're not taking guys on promise anymore. You know, you've got a good coach that's come in, someone who's had success and realised, hey, giving a year or two to someone because they've shown promise kind of isn't the way to go if you want to win a flag. So definitely seeing that from Carlton now. Yes, Bon, and I wish Stocks well. Stocks off field work, spectacular. What a role model young men have. And I, I hope St Kilda do pick him up. And perfect coach for Stocks because he's not quick. He hasn't really got many assets other than that he's hard, right? He's tough. And unfortunately, toughness doesn't win you football games. Do you know what I mean? There's something more about someone like Ross probably will utilize that hardness and hard edge. And he likes them types of players. Vossi wants to play that progressive game. So I can see it and good luck to stocks. But I agree with you. Like North, it, how many f- players get delisted and become superstars? You think every club has to delist three players a year, pretty much on average. Yeah. That's 18 lots of, f- so that's what, 52 players. Can you name more than 10 players that have been delisted on superstars? I mean, at the moment, you've got what, Jared Lyon, but he he didn't really get delisted by no. Gold Coast. He didn't want to play for them anymore. Like, do you know what I mean? Not many players do it. So, I mean, clubs don't really make football mistakes, really. So, there's obviously got to be a reason. But best of luck to him. I hope to see Stocker out in the St. Kilda White um, shortly. You want to bring up Will Setterfield? You reckon Will Setterfield? You reckon Setterfield could could do decent for us in, in the red sash? Uh, I think Will Setterfield is one of them guys that needs to have that slight on ball time. I don't know where Cowton started playing as a full-time winger because I don't think that's his game, but I like it for the Bombers because I think that he would be in the best 22 and there's opportunities. Like I said with Stocker, if the hope is for him to be a midfielder, Cowton's midfield is, you know, very crammed. It's like the Monash at 7.30. There's nowhere to get in there. Do you know what I mean? There's nowhere to get in. So... For me, I think he's very reliable. He's not a flashy player. He's not excited. Like, you don't pay your membership to go and see Will Satterfield unless you're his ma or his dad, right? Do you know what I mean? But he is a good, honest footballer, and he needs game time. And I don't think Carlton can offer him that. I don't think we need a player like that. We've sorted it out with the wing, with Blakers. He's in the team now, so we've got a full-time winger if that was the plan with Setters, so... I don't mind it. And I, I kind of like the deal we did. We didn't stand in Setfield's way. It was a next to nothing deal. It's a free risk for you. It's a free risk for Cal. And and it's the kind of thing that Essendon need to do because I think you're going to have a maybe a micro rebuild. I wouldn't say it's a full rebuild. You're not going to do what Carlton did and tear up the turf and sack the chef and everything. I think it's just going to be a nice gradual one. So Good luck to him, Setters. That's the only time I'll ever wish Will Setterfield good luck there. But out of respect, but good luck to Setters. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Awesome. So we'll move on to your draft performance, the players that you've picked up. Uh, you've had, you know, you've got extensive coverage of these players and you've actually interviewed, you know, these guys. So... Uh, most of these guys, should I say. So, you know, I know you had Jackson Bins on and I know you're a big fan of Ollie Hollands entering your entering the team. So really, you know, you, you must be really happy with this draft. Um, yeah, I mean, like a carpenter, we nailed it. Nick Austin nailed this. That's why we call him the carpenter around our parts. And Ollie Hollands, the most no-brainer pick for Carlton there. It was the logical pick of what we needed. Hard running, re- runs a faster time than... Sam Walsh, it needs to be said as well. Like the media haven't given Ollie Hollands enough respect. They rave. Like when Sam Walsh ran his time, what was it? Just under, just over five minutes, wasn't it? Six minutes, six minutes two, I think it was from memory. They made yeah. out like he was the bionic man, right? And Ollie Hollands ran a faster time. So that needs to be said. Put some respect on my boy's name, but he is a good inside out midfielder. 
midfielder as well. It's not been talked enough that he has played inside for his for his junior side to some great extent as well. So you can see where Carlton are going. The top teams heavily rotate. Um, Lockie Cohen, the Apple Isle superstar. I've been hot on this kid for a while. This kid has got a boo that was like the first time I heard the Beatles. It brings a tear to your eye. Absolute modern day acquisition for the club. And when you look at Carlton, transition was an issue last year. Um, and all the top teams have wonderful attacking threats. I don't think we have a long booming kick from the back. I think we've got we've got Dox Nous, and I think his IQ wins him a lot of transition ball. I think Saad's pace is insane. Um, but it was that long kick, and you saw Mitch McGovern before he got injured exploit Richmond with it. Cohen is a different gravy, a real exciting footballer. Can't wait to see him. And I'm the best mullet in AFL football. Bins. He's he's basically an attacking threat for Cal, and we need a winger. We've got a few defensive wingers, one that can get high half forward and really penetrate. And Harry Lemmy, I love this pick. Kid was top ten in the AFL draft this time last year. Injuries, mm. all the West Adelaide foot. They've got more forwards than you know a soccer team on their list. They had so many. The fact he was willing to go back and be trained as a key defender, also learn rook to get back in the side. Carlton need depth in all three of them positions. I think that's the smoky there for Carlton, Harry Lemmy. No one's talking about it, but with the guys he's going to learn, whether Carlton chooses a backman or a forward, we've got probably the best backman in the comp in Jacob Wietering, definitely top five, and we've probably got two of the top five forwards in the comp, Mackay and Kerno. So Harry's got a real good tutors to learn from because he's got the best in the business, and if he does, he's going to be practicing against the best in the business trying to kill him. So I really like that from Harry. Uh, I think he's one to watch in 2023, 20, 2023 in the VFL and 2024 in the AFL. I don't think he'll play next year, but just watch his development. I reckon he could be a little jet for Carlton. Mm. I actually called the Lucky Cowan um, pick when we were watching on stream. I'm like, Carlton's trade up, pick 30. Look who's available, let's go. Um, I quite likened him a bit to Jaden Short, the way that he kicks and, and has a really nice boom kick and even just a kick from, you know, the high wing into the forward line. And that's kind of something that you guys were missing, like you're saying. Doherty can do a lot, but having kind of that versatility off the halfback, really good pick for you. I wanted him at my club, but obviously we, we went a bit differently with our pick. So, yeah, really happy for you guys. And I, I commented as well, you're not paying 900K for a, half-back flanker anymore. So it, it works out all right. hundred percent. And you look at what Voss does is he likes that third. He, he likes a taller player in that area down the back. And he's that awkward size 187. He's not really tall. He's not really small, but you watch him play. He can make big guys look foolish and he can hurt small guys. So I wouldn't be surprised to see he did like bit. Um, he did like Boyd last year before Boyd mm -hmm. got hurt. I wouldn't be surprised to see Lockie debut very, very early. And I wouldn't be surprised to see him in the pocket because everyone talks about his transition, but this kid can defend too. And yeah. I really love this kid. He's he's a supreme pickup. But basically, all four picks, I think Carlton nailed the draft. I think North won the draft. Um, Brisbane, we can't count because they cheated with Father and Sons. <laughs> and... and, and uh, and Geelong, obviously, we can't give them credit because they won the flag and they somehow had picked seven. So I'd say, by default, Carlton and North are the winners of that draft. Uh, do you feel like, obviously, we've spoken off air about kind of what positions need to be filled. Do you feel like the players you've brought in kind of fill the needs that you have in the team moving forward? Or, or is there, there someone else holes. that you still need? I think there's a few holes in the list. I think the Rook situation isn't perfect because Pitt and Ed, I can't guarantee he will play 24, 25 games a year. Um, TDK, is he ready to do 25 games on his own a year is a question mark. I think he did very well last year, but I think it was obvious he needed help. At times, he's still a young guy. Obviously, the Carlton can't draft a rook. Do you know what I mean? There was no rook in there. Even Harry Bennett, no. he, he he's not ready. Do you know what I mean? So it's going to be something that Carlton have got to wait and see. So I think based on what was... In the realms of reality, Carlton nailed it. Absolutely knocked it out of the park. And I think this is what impressed me about Carlton. There was some 
scary moments in that draft where Calton years gone by would have done something ridiculous. You could see they stuck to the plan. You can see there the draft strategy before your very eyes. It makes sense. Mm. Usually at this stage, there is a time where you're like looking at the trades and drafts. Mitch McGovern would be a great point. Cow and a crying out for midfielders. So we spent big on a guy that is a forward who happens to now be a defender. Like that's how good that's turned out. A couple of years ago, we needed a midfielder. So we bought a halfback flanker and paid overs for him to play him in the midfield. And now he's a halfback flanker again and we're paying double mm -hmm. the value. It, that's Carlton that we're used to. This here is intelligent, structural. Like We almost look like a proper football team with this trend draft period. <laughs> I'm starting to believe. Who are you? Who are you under Carlton? Pardon? Ed, Ed, Ed Kerno is just there basically for, for leadership, pretty much. I mean, I'll say this. If Carlton were... Uh, a lot of people saying that. I think don't downplay Mr. Kerner because last year was freaky for him. He's never hurt. Um, but mm. I would say Cowton, inside midfielder, round 23 happened again. Cripper does himself a mischief. Who would you rather come in the side? Paddy Dow or Mr. Reliable there? Ed Kerner is oh, my wife's Ugg boots. Do you know what I mean? Mm. May not look the best, may not smell the best even. But God damn, they keep her feet comfy and reliable. So Ed yeah. Kerner for me, I I love him there. But also, it's not said enough, he is the best trainer in the world. You look at him as a footballer, not the most talented, but he gives 100%. So them four boys you've pictured above him, the best man in the world to listen to at my football club is Ed Kerner. If he tells you to drink fizzy water, you drink fizzy water. He knows how to get 100% of talent out of, his, out of his paws. So I like him there. I think he's more reliable than a lot of them guys we delisted. I'd rather see Ed Kerno on the ball than Liam Stocker in a prelim final. Definitely. Absolutely. So, speaking of a prelim final, the prediction for 2023, we've got here that we're expecting at least 13 wins out of Carlton. Uh, we went a bit conservative because throughout our discussions, a lot of the league has improved this year. It's not just Carlton. There's been these, these better teams have also seemed to, you know, to improve a lot as well through the, through the preseason, you know, the, the trade period and the draft. So wins might be a bit harder to come by. So we've got here at least 13 wins for Carlton, which would put you, you know, between the 6th to 10th spot. It's so hard to fit eight teams in the top eight this year coming up. It's right. ridiculous. Uh, where do you reckon Carlton will, you know, where do you, where do you see Carlton finishing at the end of this year? It's going to be tighter, firstly, than a frog's bottom, and they're watertight, isn't it, this year? You can see, like, you try and pick two teams to fall out of the eight, and it's hard, isn't it? Like, the brain tells you doggies because they've lost half a team. Do you know what I mean? Some really important players, and they've replaced them with people that you wouldn't exactly get excited about, but they're well run. It's hard. It's really hard, and then you expect some teams to rise. Um, I'd say it's going to be very hard for Carlton this year because now two big questions are on them. Will they ever make finals? And how did they screw up from 8-2? Like, yeah. So now it's two questions. Before it was, are they talented enough? Now it's, are they mentally talented enough? My heart of hearts, I want to see these boys not get into finals. I want to see them blitz it. I would say, count on a 4-6. to six. I've got a feeling 4-6, to six, which I think will be 14 and a bit wins. They play the extra magic round game, isn't it? So mm. I'll add one onto it and say 15. Nice. That's the hope. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, if they're a little bit better than what we saw in 2022, then basically they're there automatically anyway. So, yeah. Um, we had a couple of questions posed to us. So, um, we've spoken before about kind of your backbone players doing really well. Um, do you see they're your maybe players 15 to 22 on field getting a lot better next year? 100% because I think that Count had so many injuries. We look, I think there's a blessing to be had from the injuries last year. You've got to remember this time last year, if you named our best 22, most people had Oscar McDonald with Wheater in. Um, yeah. And most people were saying, oh, Lewis Young, he's not ready yet. He's a little bit wet behind the ears. Lewis Young played nearly the full season, was sensational, was sensational and really built into the role. 
I think Cottrell, he came in a couple of years ago through injuries and he really locked down his space this year and really said, now nah, this is my job, Jesse Motlop. So for me, they've got probably more games last year than some of them should have done because of the injuries and rotations, which I think holds them in good stead because now they've had a taste of first team 40 and some of these guys are now fit and firing. So if I'm Jordan Boyd, I'm saying, you know what? I stood in for Zach Williams. He's not having my job back. Do you know what I mean? I earned that. And I think there'll be a lot of mentality there from some of these players. Do you know what I mean? That, that. So I really do think, how can they not lift? Do you know what I mean? They've had a taste of opening the paper and being praised for once. Usually they're being panned. So if that's not infectious for these boys and that can't motivate them to be in the top eight, don't know what can motivate these boys because they're playing for a big club who love them very much and they supported them through getting beat 100 points by 16-man GWS. So they kind of owe it to themselves and us that we will back them in. So I really do think the bottom eight, 10 players will lift. And I think whatever your 22 is now, by round 23 next year, I predict four players will be in that 22 that aren't in it. I reckon four players will not some established names out and cement their players for themselves. Cool. And you reckon, do you think there's too much reliance on Cripper? I mean, he won the Brownlow this year. Just there are, there are quite a few games, especially later in the year. You saw that he was just really trying to will the side. Uh, he was doing absolutely everything he could. He was kicking more goals. He was... Doing, he was trying to do some give and goes. You know, he, he a bit of one-two action coming out of the out of the center square. Like he just seemed to really be healthy again, and he, he didn't have that back issue. So he looked like as the season went on, maybe it was the absence of Hewitt who went down with injury. But we did see him really start to emerge and be a lot more dominant. Do you think that's because he's taking over too much, or is that because is, is there too much reliance on him, or was that just? Complete due to due to injury, you reckon? Well, I mean, I think we've. If you look at, in my opinion, if you look at the Brownlow year, I think Cripper was far better, and he polls far better in the opening up to the bye. He polled insanely, and I think if you look at him at that point, George Hewitt was fit. Who you just touched on there, doing a lot of the hard yakas. So we started to see that old Crips we saw in 2019 where he really started to dominate and he showcased he's got he's a bit more than a tough guy he's also got a little bit of class i i, I would argue that every side in the world of sport could be accused of being reliant argentina in messi i think 2017 dustin martin how could you i'm pretty sure us three could have played for richmond when he was in that prelim form like it was as simple as throw the ball to dusty or kick four goals and have 40 so I think there's always he's always going to be a big part of Callum, but I think what you've seen this year from Cripper is he's been a captain. He's led from the front. He's pulled us over the line. So I think Callum mm. will always be reliant on the genius that is Patrick Cripps. Like most teams are, this guy is the heart and heartbeat of our football club. And I think as he proved in some of them close games, Cripper's willing to put, like Trent Cochin was for Richmond, put his head over the ball and pull you across the line and the boys follow him. So I, I don't think he's going to be no Crips, no Carlton. And I think Carlton have proved that this year, that you don't, we don't need Crips to be superstar to win. But I do think Crips will always be a huge influence on what Carlton do. Nice. Absolutely. I agree. I hope, I hope that we could have someone like that. I mean, someone that can put their head over the ball and... That used to be Job for us. Ever since Job went, didn't have you know that that space has been missing. Hopefully, that can become like a Perkins or something in the future. Maybe, but maybe Will I mean, so you, you have you seen, or Will Setterfield? Oh, Will Setterfield. don't get my hopes up here, Big J. You're making me dream a little bit now. But yeah, no, I think I, I really like I really rate Carlton coming up this year. Like you've said, you, you've nailed the draft. Uh, Blake is. I'm gonna. I've adopted it now. He, he's a. He's a very key acquisition, and mm. I think the sky's the limit. I think you, missing finals this year um, definitely will be a much better uh, experience for you in the long term. 
the, in the opposite way, Essendon making finals last year was a bad thing for us. Like Lloyd, said on Footy Classified, he wanted us to make finals. Um, same thing with St Kilda. They made finals the following year. Would, you know, just didn't back it up. I think just the, in, especially in the way you missed the finals this year, there, there, there is that steely resilience that's going to come this year. Um, yeah, I, I think you should definitely be excited. The, the bright times are coming. Definitely. Definitely quietly, quietly confident this year. But yeah, like I say, it does feel like something's started to turn the corner a little bit. And I don't want to do the whole coming, we're coming rubbish. But I do feel like there's there's definitely a a vibe at Carlton now that they're professional and they're quietly confident in what they achieve. So can't wait to see the boys, though, bounce a ball in anger against Richmond come round one. Yeah. And, and you're playing really exciting football too. And that's kind of something I think maybe not last year, but in previous years has been something that you guys have lacked a little bit. So I'm, I'm really happy for you too. I, I think the big thing about Carlton um, is brand. And you've just touched on that there. I think the hard thing for the last, particularly the 2016 to 2021, it was hard to say what Carlton were. What did we yeah. stand for? As a football team, were like I remember Lee Matthews saying that Carlton had so much inside midfield talent that they were fraudulent, and I remember applauding that comment. Going, he's right. We've got the best inside midfielder in the game, Patrick Cripps. We've got a lot of talent in our midfield, but they are garbage as a unit. Like there's teams with worse players doing better. So it's nice to see now Carlton stand for something. You know what you're going to get. You're going to get tough tackling. You're going to get contested football. You're going to get a team that stands up and has a crack. And particularly the first 10 rounds, a side that's not scared of scoring football goals, no. as opposed to just scoring wins off field, they actually felt like a bona fide football team. That first 10 rounds is the most fun I've had clothed for a long time. Like It was actually a joy to watch. We look good. Even when we lost, it felt like you were entertained and we were there to play football and there was something about us. So long may it continue. Yeah. Viva La Voss. Yeah, definitely. Do you guys beat Richmond next year, round one? We owe them a thumping. I, do you know what I mean? We, that, that fourth quarter, I reckon, <laughs> if we started like that, it could have been all over Red Rover. So I, I, I expect the pain. I wouldn't want to be Richmond, just quietly. After what happened in our t- round 23, I'd imagine these guys, when they get the opportunity to hit grass again, they're going to hit it quite hard. So I will yeah. back Cripper in to have a blinder. Three votes, Cripper, round one. Yeah, definitely. Well, Pommy, thanks for coming on the show today. Really appreciate it and giving you insights on Carlton. Um, is there anything you'd like to say before we head off? No, mate, make sure everyone subscribes to you guys. You guys are a great bunch of uh, blogs, and I've had a lot of fun here as well. I mean, it's not often I get a laugh with an Essendon fan without my expense being spared. So I've enjoyed uh, hanging with you two. Definitely. Well, before you head off, I just had had a great time with me. Before you you head off, I've got one question for me. Is it coming home? Yeah. Cool. England, Cal- if you want to make some money and you get it out before the World Cup final, England, Cal, and double. Done. Wow. Perfect. Um, how, awesome. do we reach you? It. how do we reach you? If the fans jump on, How? where Where can they reach you? If you search in Pommy in Oz, I am pretty much everywhere at the moment. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, everywhere but only fans. Um, you don't want to see that, so... <laughs> Come and say hi. We've got all sorts there. We're doing content with all the other fans, content and um, producers. So it's not just Cout and my show. And uh, if you are a blue bagger, you probably know me from Blue Abroad. So if you do like Cout and content or you're an opposition fan and you want to see full-grown men and women cry after a loss, make sure you go and see Blue Abroad because we do a fan cam where we're either laughing or we're crying. So it's always good fun. Nice. There won't be a lot of crying this coming year. I can see it. It's going to be a lot of happy callers on your on your on your face on your on your cams. It's going to be a very very positive year. I have no doubt. 
thank you so much for coming on, Pom. My pleasure, Joe, mate. Thank you very much for having me, guys. Catch you next time. Bye, guys. See ya.